So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, um, to my presentation about um, stainless steel claddings. And um, my name is Jörn Teipel. I work for Otto Kumpu. We are a stainless steel manufacturer, and we have supplied several large high-rise buildings with stainless steel in the past. So let me go briefly through the agenda. I will be talking about arguments, why we are using stainless steel on the facade. I will show you some examples of stainless steel claddings in history. Um, I will, of course, show you our production process to produce the facade material. I will show you our surface finishes. Then I will talk about a current cladding project that we are working on or have worked on recently. I will talk about corrosion issues. And last but not least, I would like to discuss um, the glare regulations that um, were in the media um, recently. Yeah, so what are the arguments for um, using stainless steel in architecture? And of course, there are these rational arguments. There is, of course, the high corrosion resistance of um, the material. And due to that high corrosion resistance, we have a very long durability of the material. And due to both features, of course, stainless steel has a relatively low maintenance. Then we have those arguments. It has a good formability. It has a good weldability and a good cleanability. And due to more than 85% recycling content of our material, we have a very good sustainability as well. And um, due to and we have 100% recyclability as well. So these are rational arguments. But of course, what's pretty much more interesting here that are these emotional arguments. And well, stainless steel has this noble appearing look. Um, the fact that it doesn't need to be coated so you can really see the pure material, you can feel it, um, makes it a very pure and honest material. And last but not least, it has this very fascinating metallic glossiness. So you can sum it up by saying that stainless steel perfectly combines functionality and aesthetics. So let's talk about some examples of stainless steel claddings in history. And of course, I need to mention here the Chrysler Building in New York, which was um, built in 1930. It still has this sparkling top um, of stainless steel that was used in architecture for the first time for, for that particular building. I would then also like to mention the Plaza Tower in Costa Mesa, California, which was built in 1992 just because of one reason, because it was the first project um, where Octocumpo supplied um, material for a high-rise building. And in retrospective, I need to say that we have really, really learned a lot from that first project because it is really, really a demanding process to produce uh, stainless steel for such a yeah, high application. And um, the Burj Khalifa, of course, I would like to mention, this is really um, yeah, a beautiful example of the combination of, st of stainless steel and glass. Um, a quite a glossy um, stainless steel surface was picked here. And um, yeah, it is pretty much like a lighthouse um, when the sun shines on it, that shines uh, um, throughout the desert of, or it shines into the desert of Dubai. And of course, I would like to mention the Ping An Finance Center, which we completed in 2016 in uh, Shenzhen, China. Um, yeah, this is an enormously large amount of stainless steel that is used here. I'm pretty sure this is a, the largest amount that has ever been used on, a, on one particular building, 1,700 tons. Um, yeah, and we are um, lucky to be the supplier for that building. Um, so let's just talk about the production process of stainless steel claddings. And um, well, I need to mention um, the production of stainless steel is a very high demanding process. And there are really two issues you really need to take care of here. And this is on the one hand, the flatness of the material. And on the other hand, it's the homogeneity, but throughout the complete tonnage. So not just one coil needs to be homogeneous, but it needs to fit to all the other coils. And this equal surface appearance, strip for strip and plate for plate, is sometimes not wished. So like it is here shown at the EMP Museum in Seattle, so you can see that there's a quite a variation 
in the color um, in the stainless steel that was picked, that was on purpose. Um, but in generally, this inhomogeneity is not wished. And this is a negative example. It shows the, um, the General Motors headquarters in Detroit. And um, yeah, not only can you see the inhomogeneity here, but you can also see that, is it, that there's a slight flatness problem here. So how does the production route now actually look like? Um, yeah, we start with recycled steel. This can either be a stainless steel or also carbon steel. Um, we add some alloying elements, and they are heated up in an electric arc furnace, heated up to more than 1,500 degrees so that we have um, a liquid um, stainless steel. Um, it goes then into the AOD converter, AOD stands for argon oxygen decarburization. So the word already says it. The reason here is mainly to reduce the carbon in the melt and also to reduce nitrogen. We can fine tune our alloy here by adding more alloying elements. And that goes to the continuous caster where we produce a slab. The slab goes to the hot rolling mill and we roll the slab down to a coil. It's called black hot band. The reason why it's called black hot band, it has a large layer of scale on top. And um, yeah, that scale looks black and that's why it's called black hot band. That material here, that um, hot band is, is very hard and brittle and um, therefore it needs to be annealed in the hot strip annealing. And the other reason why we anneal it, there's a pickling inside also and so we can take away that scale and in the end, we end up with also called hot band, but this is now hot band white because it has this metallic look already. This can then go to the hot rolling, to the cold rolling mill, and we roll it down to the final thickness that is required. But then the material once again is very hot, so it needs to be annealed again. So that takes place in the, bright, in the first bright annealing step. Then it goes uh, on the embossing mill. At the embossing mill, we are able to produce a pattern on the surface, like the linen pattern um, or a haze pattern, whatever is desired. But this process here again hardens the material slightly, so it needs to be bright annealed once again. And, but this is now a kind of different annealing. It's more like a recovery annealing of the material. And this then goes uh, to the tension lever, which is a very, very crucial facility in the facade production because this is the facility that is responsible for the flatness of the material. And after that, it goes to the cut to length line where we cut the sheets into the required dimension. And let me mention here, because we have that more than 85% recycling content, um, you will receive lead credits in the category leadership extraction practices if you use stainless steel. And um, due to the fact that we have a 100% recyclability without loss of quality will receive lead credits for the material in the uh, category diversion. So let's talk about surface finishes here. So for facade applications, um, there are standard surfaces available. So that would be um, the so-called 2B surface. This is a standard annealed and pickled surface. And um, there's on the other hand, the 2R surface, which is a bright annealed surface. The bright annealed surface is a very glossy surface, and the 2B is the opposite. It's a quite dull surface. Um, so now, next to the standard surfaces, we also have decorative surfaces, and these are very popular uh, for facade applications. So there are these pattern surfaces, um, like here, um, diamond square, linen, that is leather grain, a triangle austenite, microchecker, haze, and um, well, it's hard to see what that is, waterfall. And um, yeah, these are these patterned um, surfaces which are, as I said, quite popular. But of course, you can also apply polished surfaces. Um, we have quite a variety of different grids for polishing, combinations of polishing and brushed, and um, they are usually made customized, especially for a particular customer who requires a specific appearance. Then I would like to mention the special surfaces. For example, 
um, the grid line surface. This is a rolled on surface to imitate uh, a polished look. Um, then we have the super mud. Super mud is our dullest available surface. It is a shot blasted surfaces. And um, the specialty here, it is produced in line. So it's also quite cost efficient. And um, the super mud is a very, very popular um, surface that is used in, in southern Germany, Austria, Switzerland for roofing applications. And um, it's a very homogeneous surface and, and very classy looking. Um, we have the 2R square surface here. This is an improved bright anneal surface. It, ha it has even a higher gloss. The gloss comes very close to the so-called mirror polished surface. And, um, but here the advantage is that this surface is also produced in line, so compared to the mirror polish, it's also a cost-efficient process. And I would like to mention the deco mud. Deco mud is, is also a very dull surface, close to the super mud, but um, it is a different production process. It, it is a rolled-on uh, surface as well here. So um, concerning the patterned surfaces, um, we are able to offer a very wide selection of pedal material in the thickness range from 0.3 up to 3.5 millimeter and a width of up to 1,500 millimeters. But I need to mention, due to that high flatness requirements for facade applications, um, the pattern material with this high flatness, we can only produce up to 2 millimeters. And I would like to mention here the One World Trade Center. Um, we supplied a material with a surface called laser, and um, I will explain some words later uh, what laser actually is. Um, this is a current project in London. It's called um, Five Broadgate. It's the future UBS headquarters, and they supplied our standard linen. This is a research center in Germany called Caesar, and they applied uh, a bright annealed surface here on the cladding. And um, this is Edificio Forum in Barcelona. They um, required a mirror polished surface here. And not only was it mirror polished, it was also electroplated. So it was a colored mirror polished surface that was applied here. Well, just we offer yeah, quite a lot of different pattern surfaces. And there are um, the very well established ones, like uh, linen, square, haze, yeah, leather grain, um, which is very popular in elevators. Um, but there are also less established um, patterns like beads or F pattern letters, ice crystal. Um, of course, they are not really the patterns you would choose for a cladding for a facade, but um, well, they might be interesting for interior architectural applications. Um, so, yeah, let's see where where they might be finally picked. Um, so, I would now like to talk about this laser surface finish. Um, it was applied on the edges here of the One World Trade Center building. And the reason why it was picked there, the architects, they wanted to accentuate, they wanted to highlight the edges here. So they were supposed to look very, very bright. And the well-established linen pattern didn't meet that requirement. So we had to offer something with a higher brightness. And um, therefore, this laser pattern was developed. And as you can see, that laser pattern consists only of vertical and horizontal elements. And they are randomly um, scattered on the material. So um, that gave us the possibility to, to um, have a brighter appearance. But also, it was a, it's, it's a very homogeneous um, pattern. And the nice thing here is um, that under all viewing angles and light conditions, a nearly homogeneous surface is observed. That was also important in that case. So let's just, um, I would like to show you the current cladding projects we have recently done or we are working on. This is the IB Tower in Kuala Lumpur. The architect is Foster and Partners. And um, we deliver a 316L, very popular um, alloy for facade applications. And we deliver linen and bright yield material um, in the dimension 0.4. So you see that this is a quite a thin material. The reason why is um, it is used as a composite material. 
and the company Alcoa Architectural Products, they are producing a composite panel out of this material. The product is called Reno Bond, and we have the linen finish on the outside. On the inner side, we deliver this standard BA finish, and in the middle, there's the plastic material. And that um, composite panel is a very stiff and life, light and efficient solution. Now, this is um, the Five Broadgate building. It's the new UBS headquarters in London. And um, architect here is Make Architects from UK, the facade builder, the um, cladding wall company Seele in Germany. And also here, um, uh, 316L is supplied uh, with linen finish. Quite large dimension um, do the elements have, or do our sheets have, um, 1,500 times 6,150 millimeters. And the reason is the facade elements are quite large here. And this is an actual picture that um, the architect, uh, James Goodfellow, gave me ex um, extra for the presentation today. And it shows the actual construction site. So this is already um, done on the building. And this is Heaven Bryan Park in New York City. Um, architect is Paco Fried and partners. And um, facade builder is Christian Pohl in Germany and Benson Industries. And the special thing here, um, it's just regular 316L with linen, but it's quite in a large dimension, 2.3 millimeters. And the reason was um, that the facade elements have very sharp edges, and the, they could only realize it by using quite a large thickness here um, to, to, um, yeah, to hang the material to the facade and to, reali to, to um, yeah, make it happen that the facades have this very sharp optic. So the whole cladding now has this very sharp optic. Um, this is the new um, Amazon headquarters in Seattle. Um, we also supplied... Um, 316L here, but for the first time we supplied the super mud surface, which I showed you earlier, and 2B material, and um, the material here was electroplated as well, so it was colored in three different colors. These panels here show um, the champagne color, and it was the coloring was done by Inox Color in Germany. And of course, um, I would like to show you Ping An Finance Center. Um, uh, KPF is the architects, my new Yuanda, the facade builders. And um, as I already mentioned, there's this large amount of material needed um, for that particular building. So let's talk about um, the issue of corrosion. And um, as you already have seen, the 316L is the material that is usually picked for um, facade applications. And in, in that diagram here, I show you the corrosion resistance, the PRE value. PRE is the pitting resistance equivalent. This is like a mathematical value to um, give you an idea about the corrosion resistance of the material. Um, and it's drawn here as the red curve. And so the 316L has a corrosion resistance, a PRE value of almost 25, which is already a very, very high value. But there are grades that are higher alloyed. So you can see that there's chromium, nickel, molybdenum, nitrogen, copper, um, and there are higher alloyed um, grades available. For example, the duplex 2205 here. Um, but usually, without uh, with reasonably frequent cleaning of the facade, the corrosion resistance of the 316L is everywhere sufficient. But I need to say except for, and except for the, high, for the area um, around the Persian Gulf, because there's a really, really high corrosion load in that area. And the corrosion-inducing factors, that is the lack of rain there, and that leads to the formation of an adherent deposit consisting of accumulated dust, sand, which they have there, and salt, because they are so close to the sea. And this deposit accumulates on the stainless steel surface. And so you have to clean it very frequently, not to have this attached to your uh, material. Because that deposit that contains small crevices 
in which condensed humidity, humidity can act as an electrolyte to induce the corrosion. And what makes it even worse, this high daytime temperature there accelerates the corrosion process. So the 316L is actually only recommended with this frequent cleaning intervals. And when I say frequently, it should be like every second month you need to clean the, the cladding, which is quite often. And um, so in that region, actually higher alloyed grades like the duplex 2205 should be considered. Well, now let me um, talk about these glare regulations. And there was actually a lot of concern um, about glaring building fronts um, in lots of articles in the media recently. And there was, for example, the Walt Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles, then the, the Vidara Hotel in uh, Las Vegas, and the, um, yeah, the walkie-talkie building in London. And that actually caused um, cities like Singapore to um, yeah, start regulating the so-called daylight reflect reflectance of facades. And they limited that uh, to a maximum of 20%. And I would like to quote the, um, this regulation uh, from the Building Control Regulation 2013 of the Building and Construction Authority in Singapore, because that says, the use of any material on the external surface of the building which has daylight reflectance exceeding 20% is prohibited. Daylight reflectance of a material refers to the sum of both the specular and diffuse reflection of the material. And this is now the crucial thing here. It is the sum of both. So it is specular plus diffuse reflection. And just to um, tell you once again what is actually specular and diffuse reflection. So you have your incident light. And this is directly reflected as the specular reflection. So the specular reflection has, um, is reflected under the same angle as the angle of the incident light. But of course, there's also this diffuse reflection, and diffuse reflection is what one could consider as the scattered reflection, and that goes into the 180-degree space. So we did some measurements on stainless steel and on aluminum, and what is shown here on the vertical axis is the total reflectance that is the same as the daylight reflection because it's the sum of both, so the total reflections in percentage. And I've uh, chosen some of our, our surface finishes here on stainless steel. It's, it's not coated, the stainless steel. Um, we did measurements on aluminum, also not coated, but also coated or anodized with like black anodized here. And this is the limitation in Singapore the 20%. And you see that all the surfaces that we, are, or that we have have a total reflectance of around 60%, which is actually quite natural for the material. And you can, for example, choose the 2R square. This is the glossiest surface we can provide. Of course, this has this very, very large amount of specular reflectance and this very, very small amount of diffuse reflection. And then the 2R, 2B, the linen. And if you go to the supermat, I already said that this is our dullest available surface. And of course, here, the specular reflectance is quite low. It's at around 1 to 2 percentage. And there's a large amount of diffuse reflection. So that's usually what happens. If we, if we reduce the specular reflections, for example, by roughening the surface, you automatically increase the diffuse reflection. And the sum of both in stainless steel usually stays constant. So there's nothing to do, nothing you can do to ever reach that limit of 20%. So if we go now to the aluminum, um, aluminum, for example, the mirror polish, of course, has this high specular reflectance and just a very small portion of diffuse reflection. Now, if you anodize it, the naturally anodized material then has this very small amount of specular reflection and this large amount of um, diffuse reflection. And yeah, 
both of the surfaces are quite above that limitation. The only thing you can do, you can anodize it black. But of course, um, yeah, is it really wished if you coat stainless steel, you buy the expensive material and then you coat it with a black color, that would really destroy the characteristics of the material. And um, as I already said, roughening decreases the specular reflectance, but at the same time increases the diffuse reflectance. So the daylight reflectance remains more or less constant. So uncoated stainless steel can never fulfill this required 20% of daylight reflectance. Now, if you look very closely again to the media article and to the buildings, they all had concave and crescent-shaped um, facades um, facing in southern direction. And that was really the, the awful thing here because they acted as parabolic mirrors and they were focusing the sunlight and causing <coughs> these glare problems. And also, um, most glare issues discussed in the media were caused by glass because the Vedera Hotel didn't have any stainless steel. And also the walkie-talkie doesn't have. It is actually the glass that caused those, those glare issues. And glass does predominantly reflect specular. And um, so that's actually the thing. The specular reflection is responsible for these glare issues. And that's why we really say that those regulations in Singapore should be um, yeah, revised. And instead of limiting those, this daylight reflections, only the specular reflections should be regulated. And right now, um, obviously in Singapore, they have realized that there is an issue because they, they don't want to look Singapore black in like 50 years. So... Um, they, they, right now, they have like a, a course by course, uh, um, a case by case um, uh, regulation. So you hand in the material, they check it, and they approve it, even if it, it is more. It has more than twenty percent uh, daylight reflectance. So on the other hand, but it drove us to the development of new pattern finishes with low reflectance, and uh, we already have developed one. The challenge here is to maintain this liveliness and sparkle to keep the characteristic appearance of stainless steel. Let me quickly sum up the presentation. Stainless steel is a classy and much valued cladding material for sophisticated architecture. The production of cladding materials requires a deep know-how and experience. And various surface finishes are available for facade application. And the high corrosion load in some Middle East countries need to be considered when um, building in this region and new restrictions in Singapore concerning the daylight reflectance of facade material were discussed, analyzed, and questioned. So these high-quality orders are challenging us and give us the opportunity to expand our know-how, but the continuously growing know-how makes us confident to accomplish further great projects in the future, and I'm at the end of the presentation and would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.